It's always a joy to be here with you all today. I was here in the first service, great crowd. I'm sure that this is going to be as great as the first one. Amen? Amen? Okay, some of you agree, some of you don't. That's fine with me. The word is still the word, and it does not return void, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Are you all sending your youth to that thing, to the, what is it, I, Illy? Is, how do you say that, Illy? Oh, I-L-Y, I'm sorry, I-L-Y. Are you sending them to... Let me just give you, this, is, this sermon is not on uh, relationships or, or marriage, but little, little side note for you, 75% of your kids will marry their worst parent. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> true statement, I'm not making that up. Okay, so dads, the likelihood of your daughters marrying someone like you is very high. Moms, the likelihood of your son marrying someone like you is very high. Be the best. Don't be the worst. When you ask somebody, who's your worst parent? Oh, that's really hard. Because uh, they don't want to put anyone on the spot or throw anyone under the bus. So then I ask them the next question. If you were out of town, out of the country for two years, and you came back, you hadn't seen your parents, and you had to choose between mom or dad to spend the next day with, who would you spend it with? Oh, well, of course, I'd spend it with. So then they'll tell me mom or dad. And I go, oh, so the other one is your worst parent. <laughs> so you don't care to spend time with them. Anyways, I enjoyed the, the worship set, didn't you? Wasn't that amazing? I just loved it. You know, that last one especially, uh, you know, you've been so good to me or, or good to me. Just to think that God is so good to us. To wake up, you know, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. To wake up every morning and simply say, God, you are so good. Like, I don't deserve any of this, but yet you are good. You know, in your mercy and in your compassion, you are so good. And in spite of whatever can be happening in our world, God, you are so good. You know, you are so good. And so last week, I was here for Pastor John's message. How many of you were here? Raise your hand. Okay. So you kind of, yes, it was, it was a great message. And one of the things that really... Uh, I, I'm one of those, you know, kind of a little ADHD, and so when you say something, it, it'll take me on a rabbit trail, and so he talked about getting lost, and when he talked about that, I started putting together a sermon in my head, you know, when he talked it, because I said, okay, I'm going to be there next, next week, and so I said, oh, okay, I can segue from this, and I started to create all these mental pictures, and I said, okay, got it, and so when he's talking about uh, coming back to the valley uh, with some other pastors from the church, if you recall, the conversation or the, the, uh, the, the story went like this, that they were coming back and that they were so deep in the conversation that he got distracted basically and took a wrong turn. And as he took a wrong turn, it, I don't know if it was an hour or so later that one of the pastors simply said, hey, are we on the right road? And then when he looked, he said, you know, or not, why didn't you tell me? You know, and I guess the conversation was just so entertaining that they just went off on a tangent. And so I was thinking about that, how we can easily end up at a different destination because we get so distracted. And so it took me back to when I was 21, and I was moving from Houston to Monterrey by myself, packed up my car, and it was 2 in the morning, and I took off. I said, okay, I'm going to get a head start. I took off at 2 in the morning, turned on the radio. Yes, it was a radio. I turned on the radio. And as I was driving for about three and a half hours, the radio started getting a little fuzzy, and so I tuned it into the next radio station. Now, I wasn't a born believer back then. I didn't come to know Christ until I was 29. But I started to tune it in, and I remember clearly hearing the, uh, the DJ say, Ra uh, Baton Rouge Radio. <laughs> and so I stopped, and I thought, wait, hold it. Baton Rouge, and they were playing some funky music. I said, wait, hold it. So I pulled over, no GPS, no Google Maps, nothing. I didn't have a map. That was way before MapQuest, for those of you who remember MapQuest. And I pulled over to a gas station. I said, where am I? They said, you are in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <laughs> I said, oh, which way is the border? <laughs> that way. <laughs> Needless to say, I was frustrated, but I had gotten distracted. Now, I was distracted with the radio. I was distracted by the darkness. I was distracted because there were no signs. I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention to the signs. That was just all on me. 
So I was thinking about us as Christians, and I thought, well, as Christ followers, if we're truly Christ followers, a Christ follower follows Christ. But can we get to the point where we stop following Christ and we just call ourselves Christ followers or Christians? But we're not following anyone because every Christ follower needs Christ. We need a shepherd. And so it took me to Psalm 23. And as Pastor John was talking, all I could hear was Charlie Brown's teacher. Because my mind was somewhere else. I was putting together today's message. Now, the world today, if you haven't noticed, we have so many opportunities to be distracted. So many. And social media is bombarding you left and right. The news left and right. You're either distracted with inflation. You're distracted by how expensive gas is or groceries, or you're distracted by what is going on at that big white house on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, or you're distracted with UFOs, because now we have aliens apparently, and so that's another distraction, or some of you more hip people are distracted with Yaritza y su esencia. <laughs> yeah, those of you who laughed, <laughs> you're distracted with Yaritza y su esencia. <laughs> okay. So we have a lot of distractions, and we need a shepherd. If we are Christ followers, we follow Christ. And so it took me back to when I was about nine years old. I was with my father, and we were driving in the outskirts of Monterrey in his hometown, population 200, small town. And we were visiting on a vacation, and so we were leaving, and we were driving alongside the hills. There's some beautiful mountains. It's the Sierra Mountain mountain range. And one of the hills that came off of the Sierra Madre. And we're driving by, and my dad points to the side, and he says, do you see those white dots? I said, I see them. He says, they're sheep. And I said, no. He says, yes. He says, let's pull over. And then my dad keeps on looking, and he says, you know what? I think I know the shepherd. I said, no, you don't, Dad. He says, we went to school together in elementary school. <laughs> no, you, you didn't, Dad. Well, my dad, we walked up a little more, and they came down a little, a little lower, and so my dad calls the shepherd, and in fact, it was his friend. And so the shepherd comes, and he's got all the sheep, and he shows me how sheep are like, uh, like dogs, you know, not like cats, but like dogs. He started calling the sheep by name. I, I'm not kidding you. I mean, he called each and every one of them. He had a good-sized flock, and he started calling every one of them by name. Some had people names. Some had nicknames. And every time he would call one, the sheep would come to him. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. And so they knew his voice, and they knew their names because he called them, and they came to him. And so fast forward many years later, of course, as a born-again believer, I come to realize that John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. John 10, 27 says, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Every Christ follower needs Christ to follow. He needs a shepherd. He is the good shepherd the master shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus. Now, how does or how do sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd? Because they spend time with him. That's how they recognize his voice. Last night, my son Daniel, who is 10, he says to me, Dad, I'm setting my alarm early in the morning and I'm going to get up probably, you know, an hour and a half ahead of time, ahead of his schedule. <laughs> and I said, what for? He says, I'm going to do what you do. I'm going to get up and study. I'm going to read. And so what that tells me is he's been watching. He says, I'm going to read like you. He didn't get up. His alarm went off. I had to turn it off because it was getting a little annoying. <laughs> and so I turned it off and he, you know, slept another two hours. But he says, I want to do what you do. The more they spend time with us, the more they resemble us. It's amazing. I was watching the other day, you know, I'm not into sports and watching sports on TV. I'm not into golf or anything like that. But I was watching the comparison. They were doing a parallel 
of Tiger Woods and his son. And how he mimics his father in everything. His gestures, the way he holds the club, the way he swings, the way he stands, the way he pivots, everything. And I'm like, that's because he spent so much time with his dad. That's a really good analogy. This is how we become more like him by spending time with him. And that's when we start to recognize his voice because we spend so much time. Well, I haven't heard his voice in a long time. Or I've never heard his voice. Well, I've never heard an audible voice of God either. But I've heard him in my spirit. And how do I know it's his voice? Because it lines up with his word. And how do I know that it lines up with his word? Because I know the word. Amen. Now, the only way you can know his word is by getting into the word. Brother, how do I grow my faith? Well, there's a simple formula. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's the only way. How do I grow my faith? What can I do? How do I pray? No, you get into the word of God. That's how your faith grows. And so that's how you come to know the voice of God. The shepherd. Jesus talks about the parable of the sheep and the goat, and he talks about the final, the judgment day. And he says, during those days, he says that the sheep will be separated from the goats. Now, what is the difference between sheep and goats? Well, sheep are defenseless. They are vulnerable most of the time. They are afraid. They're nervous. They're anxious. They have big bodies, short legs, can't swim. Their wool is heavy. And what about goats? Oh, goats are rebellious, bullheaded. They do their thing. They don't listen to a shepherd. They go their way. They butt heads with the shepherd. They butt heads with other animals. They want to do their thing. At the end of the day, the sheep will be separated from the goats. Sheep need a shepherd. It is when you come to realize that you are like the sheep. Why did David use that analogy or that metaphor? Well, because sheep are dumb. Meh. <laughs> can you identify with the sheep? Oh, you can't. Lord, give them some humility. <laughs> That's why he uses the metaphor. We are defenseless, vulnerable, and without vision if we're not connected to the shepherd. We will get lost. We will go astray. If we don't have him. I was reading about World War II. And it kind of connected this, what I'm about to tell you with Psalm 23, especially verse 1. Which, by the way, Psalm 23 verse 1 says, the Lord is my, I shall not. Okay, you got it. At least you got that right. First part. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Means that he provides. And so I was reading about World War II and the uh, concentration camp in Auschwitz and Dachau. And how after the war was over, they went in, the U.S. went in, and they rescued the children. They rescued all of these kids from the concentration camps. Of course, they were traumatized. They were malnourished. They had been affected mind, body, and spirit. And so they bring these kids into a safe place, and they start to work with them. They start to feed them. They dress them. They have pediatricians, psychologists, psychiatrists. They have everything. But these kids had a problem. They weren't able to reconcile their sleep. They weren't able to sleep. They would go to bed and they would fidget. They would toss and turn. They just could not sleep. They would sleep a few hours. They would not rest. And these doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. Until one day, one of the psychologists had one of those breakthrough moments. He had a proverbial light bulb moment. And he went to the local baker And he said to the local baker, will you bake X amount of loaves? And he did. He brought those loaves of bread back to the children. And when they went to bed, he handed each one of them a loaf of bread. The kids lit up. They held their loaves. And that was the first night they were able to sleep. The loaf of bread, and there's a picture up there. The loaf of bread gave them this assurance if you have that picture of the, uh, the kids with the loaves, there you go. There you go with the loaves of bread. That loaf of bread gave them this assurance that there would be provision the next day. 
there was security. They felt safe. And they held on to that loaf of bread and they were able to sleep. Jesus said, John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never, never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. And so these kids were anxious. They were afraid. After COVID, in, in, in my practice in therapy, I saw so many teenagers that couldn't sleep. Adults that couldn't sleep. And it was all because of the fear that had been instilled in them through the pandemic. We still have people who are driving their cars, sing, single drivers with a mask on. And although it may seem funny to you, I extend empathy and mercy and grace, but I want to be like that crazy guy in the video that goes and knocks at their window. Pop, 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 pop. It's okay to take it off. But they're afraid. And you have to show empathy. But you have, to have, you, have to, uh, you have to guide them through a healing process. I was telling the first service, and then I got a lot of people asking me about it, is that I want you to understand the, the anatomy of anxiety. And so when people are anxious, they're usually on high alert. They are in survival mode. I talked about it a few weeks ago. They are in uh, fight, flight, or, or freeze mode. And so their cortisol is shot, you know, it's high levels of cortisol. They're anxious, they can't sleep. They have palpitations. Their necks are tight. It's, it's just impossible to reconcile your sleep that way. And so the way that the brain works, it works with electricity frequencies. And so when we are, like right now, in our highest form of cognition, because we are in our alpha uh, uh, frequency or our beta frequency, when we're always like that, in high alert, we can't sleep. And so we have to bring it down to another level. And that sometimes requires, of course, discipline, creating habits, doing things differently. There's a way to do it so that you can reconcile your sleep. So last night, even last night, my 10-year-old my says, Dad, would you play it for me? I created an audio. And that audio is recorded with binaural sounds, binaural beats with different frequencies. But the secret behind it is is that as you listen to it, and it helps you go from a beta or an alpha down to a theta or a delta frequency, I've also added scripture to it. That's the secret sauce, is the scripture. And the scripture is just God's promises. And so he plays it. It's 14 minutes long. On the seventh minute, he crashes. And everyone else who listens to it does, because it helps you wind down, because you're in a state of high alert. It's like the bread, bringing it closer to you, knowing that God's got your back. It's on my storyline on Instagram, so don't ask me later. Thank you. <laughs> I posted it this morning for you because I knew. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> Follow me or don't. I, uh, I know my oldest son is in the crowd. I won't point him out. Um, but I had, was wearing a shirt the other day. I posted a picture. My, and don't judge me, please. Well, I guess I don't, I don't work here, so I'll leave and then disappear. <laughs> But my shirt said, uh, y'all need Jesus and Jordan Peterson. Anyways, I thought that was kind of funny. We need to know that we are mind, body, and spirit. We need to work on all three. Would you read Psalm 23 with me, please? It's on the back of the screen. See, back there, we're going to put it up there. And read it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, I want you to understand this. There is no power in reciting it. You can re recite this all you want. The power does not reside in its memorization. The power resides in knowing and believing what it says. 
That's, that's where the power is at. So I want to share this with you. In the next uh, half part of this sermon, what I'm going to do is break down Psalm 23 for you so you can see the facets of God within Psalm 23. But my encouragement to you starting now is that you would take Psalm 23 and make it yours. Make it yours. When you go to the doctor, the doctor says to you, take this pills, these pills three times a day. What do you do? You take your pills. For a week, for a month, for a year, or for a lifetime, you take your pills. When you get on an airplane, you don't know who's piloting the plane, but you have faith in the pilot. You don't even know who it is, but you get on the plane. So you follow these certain things without even knowing what you're doing. But we know who the Father is. We know who the shepherd is. We know what God has promised us. And so we take that word and we make it ours. We don't only recite it. We don't only study it. It's, not, it, it's, not, it's like faith. faith. Faith isn't a concept that you study Faith is not an idea that you rehearse. Faith is a lifestyle that you live. That's faith. Psalm 23, it's the same thing. It's not, oh, let me go to it when I'm struggling. No, no. It is, let me, first of all, memorize it so that it drops down into my heart. And when it drops down into my heart, it's going to bring transformation. Psalm 23 was written by King David. Nobody really knows when he wrote it, but theologians believe he wrote it the latter part of his life. He died around 70 years of age, so he was about 68 when he wrote it. Why do they think that they wrote it at that part of his life? Because only someone who had a strong walk with the Lord could have written such a beautiful psalm. And so this was years of walking with the Lord, years of going through different things in his life. So King David writes Psalm 23. And he uses this metaphor where he compares God to the, the shepherd to God and we are the sheep. And so it's a parallel, it's a contrast. And so God is the shepherd, we are the sheep. And so he writes Psalm 23. Psalm 23, unfortunately, is used most of the time at funerals. But it is not a woe is me kind of psalm. It is not a sad psalm. David is not crying for help. He is not in, in, in desperation David is writing Psalm 23 as a declaration of faith and a declaration of his reliance on the Lord. That is Psalm 23. So when we wake up and we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Regardless or in spite of what may be happening around in my world, the Lord continues to be my shepherd and I shall not want. And within Psalm 23, we see the different facets of who God is, just a few of them. And I want to highlight those facets, and I want to teach on Psalm 23 today. So Psalm 23, verse 1. And, and, and another little side note is this is what I want you to understand. How many days does it take to form a habit? <laughs> You're what did you say? You're close. 21? Eh, no. Sorry, it's not 21. That's what you've been taught. Not true. There's no, that's very anecdotal. There's no science behind it. 63. 3. 63. 63, there are science to prove that. 63 days of doing the same thing over and over and over. Let me explain this to you very briefly so you can understand why it's important to read Psalm 23, to regurgitate it, ruminate it, chew on it consistently. As you do this, if you were to take Psalm 23 seven times a day, as a doctor says, take this pill three times a day. If you take Psalm 23 and you read it seven times a day, by the seventh day, you will have memorized it. Now, is it going to impact your life? Probably not as much, but if you keep on doing it for a, a, length, a lengthy time, it'll start to change you. It'll start to change your heart to the point where it starts to change your phraseology and your vocabulary. So let me, let me kind of explain the progression of your thought process. This is how it works. You study Psalm 23 seven times a day for seven days, you're going to memorize it. And then it becomes kind of natural, so now you know it, now you don't have to read it. And so throughout the day as you're driving or you're at HEB, you're at work, and then you're reciting it in your mind. Eventually, it's going to drop down into your heart. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, so now you have it here, drop down to here. Now your words have been affected by Psalm 23, so now you sound different. Your phraseology is different. Now you're not so negative, so pessimistic. Now you're faith-filled. Now there's words of faith that are coming out of your mouth. It's not, today is going to be a horrible day. No, no, in spite of whatever's going on, today's going to be a good day. This is not pie-in-the-sky thinking. This is not esoteric, mystical stuff. No, this is not manifest. That's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, okay? <laughs> manifest it, brother. That's, uh, I won't, don't even want to get into that. 
the word of God is what brings transformation. Okay, amen. And so, you go from here, whatever you study goes into your heart. Your heart will, whatever you study will go down into your heart. Then it will change your words. Your words will affect your emotions. Your emotions, in turn, will impact your decision-making process. Your decision-making process eventually will become actions, and those actions repeated over time become your habits. Your habits form your character, and your character, to, character will lead you to your final destination in life, and it started with a thought. Was that too fast? Oh, a little bit. Okay, let me go back a little bit. <laughs> Here goes. You ready? Your thoughts... Your thoughts become words. Your words impact your decisions. Your decisions impact, I'm sorry, go back again. Your words become, your thoughts become words. Your words affect your emotions. Your emotions affect or impact your decision-making process. Your decision-making process later become actions. Your actions repeated over time become your Habits after 63 days. Your habits form your character, and your character will lead you to your final destination in life, and it all started with a thought. Okay? Did you all get that? Okay. If you can harness that idea, if you can take that with you today and harness that idea and apply Psalm 23, it'll, it'll change your life. Verse 1. Verse 1 is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The facet that we see of God right there is the very nature of the Godhead. The Lord is my shepherd is Jehovah Ra'a, which in Hebrew, Ra'a means shepherd, and it also means friend. And so not only is the Lord my shepherd, the Lord is my friend. And so Jehovah Ra'a is what we see. That's the facet that we see in that first verse. And in, in the example that I gave you about the bread, you know, knowing that God is the provider, knowing that when you have him, you lack nothing, knowing that he is your source of everything, knowing that not only is Jehovah Ra'a, but he's also El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. Amen. Amen. Verse 2, he makes me. To lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. Right there, the facet that we see of God is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Jehovah Shalom. And that's why Jewish people, that's how they greet you. They say, Shalom. The Lord is peace. Shalom. We don't see a lot of that in our, in our, in our life these days. We don't see a lot of Shalom. Because we choose not to see the shalom. Because we're on this relentless pursuit for more. This relentless pursuit to acquire, to procure, to obtain, to have. And so we have no shalom. And so the word says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. And my father and I were at a red light on Buddy Owens and Ware Road. And one day he looks at me and he points at the red light. My dad is a very wise person. He's 81 now. And see, he says to me, that's what God is like. And I said, like a red light? He says, yes. He says, you know how Psalm 23 says he makes me to lie down in green pastures? Do you see that it says he makes me? It doesn't say that he suggests to me or that he recommends to me. He says he makes me. He says, so sometimes in your relentless pursuit in the busyness of life, he says, because busyness goes is counter is countercultural to the kingdom culture. He says, you gotta slow down. Because if you don't slow down, he's going to make you lie down in green pastures. And I thought, wait, hold it, what? Barajéame la más despacio, papá. He says, people get into this crazy frenzy of wanting more and more and more and more. And they lose sight of the shepherd. He will make you lie down in green pastures. God does that? Absolutely. Yep, what does the Bible say? A father who loves his children disciplines his children. Spare the rod, spoil the child. 
Have you ever spanked your kid? Ah, don't say it. You're probably, I'm not going to raise my hand. CPS workers around here. <laughs> Have you ever spanked your child? I read the Dr. Spock book. He says, don't spank kids. Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's how God is. God says, okay, you're not wanting to stop and slow down and, 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 and rest in the green pastures. I'm going to make you. Not only am I going to make you, but as you're laying down, you're facing up straight to the heavens. Now you can connect with me. So, so I say this a lot. Say, allow yourself to be broken before God has to come in and cause you to be broken. God does that? Yes. And he does that to save you. To save you. Because he sustains you. And sometimes, you know, as parents, we got to be tough on our kids. Amen? Amen? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Shepherds, David, as he's writing this, David is remembering his time as a shepherd boy. Remember he was a shepherd boy in the Judean hillside? And he's out there with the sheep. Remember when, when uh, Samuel, the prophet, showed up to his house, knocked at Jesse's door. Jesse opened the door. And he said, I'm here to anoint the new king. And Jesse brought in seven of his eight kids, all royal looking, very priestly, very handsome looking guys. And Samuel went from the first one to the last one. And God said, no. And God reminds him, he says, I'm not looking to anoint good looks, character qualities, talent, skills, accolades, degrees, possessions, good looks. He says, I'm here to anoint a heart. So something's wrong because I don't see that in these seven boys. So then he turns to Jesse, the prophet does, and he says, do you have anyone left? And with a great hesitation, he goes, oh, yeah, he's out in the hills, but he's a shepherd boy. Bring him in. We won't sit down and have dinner until he does. And when David comes in, God tells him, that's my man. He wasn't even a man. He was a boy. But God calls the things that are not as though they were until they become what he has called them to be. I want to say, praise God, I want to say this to you. And this is exactly what you do for your children, parents. This is what you do for your husband, wife. This is what you do for your wife, husband. You call the things that are not as though they were until they become what God has called them to be. Your husband's not here with you today and you've been here for several years and he's not here yet. Well, you call the things that are not as though they were until God calls. Not what you want them to be, but what God has called them to be. See, because what you want sometimes is coming from the flesh, not from the spirit. So you call the things that are not as though they were until they become what God has called them to be. So David comes in, he's anointed, and you know his story. He becomes the king. But, but as he's out there on the hill, Judean hillside with his sheep, he writes this, this verse, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, because he knew. That sheep have four chambers in their stomach. And as they're ruminating, as they're grazing, and they're out there on the Judean hillside, he would start them, he would have them go out and graze four in the morning. He would be with them all the way through 11 a.m. When the sun was scorching hot, he would bring them in and find a place of rest, a place with a shade, and he would force them to lie down. Why did he have to force them to lie down? Because they're very fearful. If they don't know their environment, they're fearful. So he would have to force them to lie down and rest so that they wouldn't die out under the blazing sun. That's why God makes us to lie down in green pastures. It's for our own welfare, our own benefit. Amen? Amen. Now, are we like sheep? Are we afraid at times? Yes. Is that something that God has wired in us? No. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given you the spirit of fear or of timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So the next time your husband says you're crazy, you say, uh-uh, God has given me a sound mind. Well, I don't know why I said that, the husband. Could be the other way around. <laughs> no, me estás bien zafado. Psalm 46.10. I shared this earlier in the service was that during, during the time of being a caregiver, not only a husband, but a caregiver to my, my first wife, 
she went through 15 years worth of cancer and so radiation and chemotherapy. And, and, and I remember that what we had right there in front of us in our bedroom was a frame. We had it and it was Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. And we would wake up, I, I would wake up not knowing if she would wake up. But we would wake up and I would see that. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. I got you. I got you. And even when in 2007 when I woke up and I said good morning, corazón, and she did not reply because she had passed away in her sleep next to me, I had to envision myself for the next two years alongside the shepherd holding on to his hand and walking through that valley of the shadow of death. I had to picture, and that's what got me out, is was holding on to the shepherd, knowing that I needed to be still and allow him to operate in my life, and he was the source of my peace and continues to be. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The facet that we see of God there is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. You see, David was, as he's writing this, and I'm just imagining that he's thinking about the time when he was with his sheep out on the Judean hillside, and he's thinking about the Lord restores my soul, and he's thinking about the parallel between the shepherd and God and the sheep and his children. And he's thinking about all of these things, and he's, how does a shepherd restore a sheep's soul? Well, there's, there's a term in uh, sheep herding, and it is cast sheep, and there's a picture up there, uh, a cast sheep. Yeah, it, it looks kind of, it's funny, but it's not funny. Because if the shepherd doesn't realize that the sheep is cast, now, how did it get there? It was afraid, it was trying away from a predator, or it heard a noise, it saw something, and it became so anxious, so afraid, that it ran tripped over itself, and landed like that. Why do they land like that? Because their bellies are full. They have four chambers. They have a lot of food there. And so gravity and weight puts them in that position. Can it get out of that position? No. Just like a turtle that's upside down cannot get out of that position. It needs help. So when a shepherd sees a cast sheep, the shepherd runs over to the sheep because it knows that it only has a matter of a few minutes to save its life because if it leaves it that way, first of all, the blood will flow all the way to its belly and then all the gases from the belly will ca cause it to suffocate. And so the shepherd needs to go over and this is what the shepherd does. He very gently turns the sheep on its side. He's in the process of restoring the sheep. And so he starts to massage the sheep's legs to restore circulation and once that's happened, then he pulls it and brings it back on its right side. That's how a shepherd restores sheep. What do we look like when we are cast? Think about it. Everyone has a different picture in their mind of when you have felt like that, defenseless. Your life is upside down. You seem like you're never going to get out of that hole, out of that rut. Some of you are stuck in that rut right now. But the shepherd restores our soul. And we cry out to the Lord and you say, Lord, restore my soul. You are Jehovah Rapha. David remembers when he was in Ziglag. He remembers coming back with, the army, with his men, his hundreds of men, after beating the Philistines. And they come back to Ziglag, a temporary campsite where the women were at, where the children were at. And he's coming back with his men. And they're victorious. And they're thinking they're going to throw a huge party for them because of their victory. But little did he know that the night before he arrived, the Amalekites, which were cowards, showed up at the midnight hour and took everything. Destroyed the campsite, took the women, the possessions, the children. So now David is there with his men. They start to cry. The Bible says that the men and David cried until they could, they could cry no more. I don't know if you've ever been there before where you've cried and you have no more tears. I have. Where you just cry and cry and cry and you have no more tears to cry. And by the way, it's okay to cry. If anyone's ever told you don't cry, 
Men, don't cry. That's a lie. God wired us to cry so that we could externalize the pain that's within us. It's part of a healing process. And so they cried until they could cry no longer. And then on top of that, if that weren't enough, David starts to hear the men talking. They're mumbling in the back and they're talking about stoning David to death because now they're blaming him for their loss. And so the people that followed him, loved him, encouraged him, supported him, now want to kill him. His soul was destroyed. But I love what happened after that. The Bible says in 1 Samuel, but David, oh, I love that, but David, as I love the, in the Bible when it says, but God, <laughs> but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God and in him found strength. He restored his soul. Let me say this again. Y'all didn't get it. But David encouraged himself. His wife wasn't there to encourage him. His children weren't there to encourage him. He couldn't turn on the TV, a YouTube video, a podcast to be encouraged. The pastor wasn't there to encourage him. Nobody was there to encourage him. As a matter of fact, the people behind him were discouraging him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God and in him found strength. God restored his soul. And then after that, and I failed to mention this in the first service, after that he went and asked the Lord, what do I do? He said, pursue the Amalekites because surely I will give you the victory. And that's exactly what happened. Amen? Amen? That's how God operates. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This is Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Now, because of time, I'm only going to focus on you anoint my head with oil. At the end of the day, when the shepherd is bringing the sheep into the fold, the fold is like the pen where they keep all the sheep. After the, before before uh, having them come into the fold for the night, the shepherd will get down on his knee. He's calling the sheep in. And he grabs them by the head and he looks at their head to make sure that there are no cuts or bruises because there are so many rocks and thorns in the Judean hillside that some of them will come back with cuts and bruises. And so what he has to do before they go into the fold is anoint their heads with oil, olive oil and some medicinal herbs. And they create a concoction that was very, you know, back then in the day they would use that a lot. And they would anoint the head with oil so that that cut would not become infected and then take the life of the sheep. So every day, every day meticulously look at the sheep before going into the fold. What does that have to do with us? David writes in the Psalm 139, he says, search my heart, O God. Okay, search, search, search my heart, O God, and show me if there's any iniquity within me, any anxious thoughts. And if there is, Lord, anoint me, heal me. That's what that represents to us. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. It represents God's anointing. It represents God's healing. He anoints your head with oil at the end of the day. You think that he doesn't know? He knows. You think he wasn't watching? Oh, he saw. Oh, he heard. And he hurts for you. He saw it. Anoint my head with oil, Lord. Oh, verse 6, the last verse. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's such an assurance in David's mind and in David's heart. He says, surely. <laughs> I told the first service that I was driving the other day. And a car with license plates from another country, in other words, from across the border, uh, from another country, kind of got in front of me. I don't know what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm a very cautious driver. I haven't gotten a ticket in probably 20 years. I'm a very cautious driver. But they, they thought it was uh, appropriate to shoot the finger at me for some odd reason. Thank you. I said to myself, Many people would be adversely impacted by something like that. It would ruin your day. But I just say, surely, <laughs> goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So listen to this. Amen. Listen. 
I, I want you to focus on this because I think that this is what's going to really speak to you the most. You're probably thinking, well, David was like one of a kind. Uh, yes, God called him a man after his own heart, and yes, but he really messed up a lot of times, like royally. And I can, I can give you all the bullet points. He was an adulterer. He cheated on his wife. He killed the husband of the wife, the husband of the woman with whom he committed adultery to hide his sin. He rebelled against God. There were times when he didn't listen to God and he rebelled against him. He was a passive leader. He was a bad dad. I mean, come on. Amnon, Absalom, and Tamar. Picture that, where you have Amnon rape his half-sister, Tamar, and then Absalom kills his half-brother, Amnon, because of what he did to Tamar. And then Absalom rebels against his dad and wants to overthrow the, the throne and take his position. And then what happens to Absalom? He dies. David asks his men to go get him and bring him in to talk to him, to knock some sense into him with grace and love and mercy, and he dies. They drive some arrows into his heart. So David's got a problem. But at 68 years of age, at 68 years of age, he ruled and reigned for 40 years. At 68 years of age, he writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Why did he have that guarantee? I'll tell you why. And this is something we all ought to practice. David did not go back and commit the same sin over again. David always showed repentance. He showed evidence of a contrite and humble spirit. How do I know if somebody has truly repented? Well, only God knows, but tell, I'll tell you what the outward expression of true repentance looks like. Transformation. True repentance brings forth transformation. That's when you know that it is real. That's when you know that your children are truly repentant. There's godly remorse, godly repentance because there's transformation. So here's my challenge to you. Have a humble and contrite spirit. <laughs> All of us, we need to have that, right? Because the Bible says that God will not despise those who have it. Milton, God doesn't hear me anymore. Do you have a humble and contrite spirit? He hears you, but his hand is inoperable. You have incapacitated the hand of God. I can do that. Yes, you can. Because you have a hardened heart. He hears you. What does the Bible say that pleases God? Without faith, it's impossible. Can you have faith and a hardened heart at the same time? Nope. You can't. You can't. And so what we need to do is take that Psalm 23, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, until it becomes part of our spirit, our hearts. It alters our words. It alters our emotions. It alters our decisions, our actions, our habits, our character, and leads us to that place that David writes about, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll end with this. Amen. Amen. I have about an hour and a half more of sermon, but I'll stop because um, of my time. I want to leave you with this quick analogy so you can understand. God is good, huh? Amen. God is good. Yeah. He's good. Ah. I get on my knees a lot. Last night I was walking through our school, our Covenant Christian Academy, and we're doing so many things and building and beautifying and People say, when I walk on your campus, I feel something. I go, it's the Spirit of God, man. And I was walking by myself at 8 o'clock at night, locking up because we had workers there. And I just came to a point where I was like, God, what did I do to deserve all of this? You're so good. You're so good, God. It is in your, your mercy, your compassion, it is through Christ. What did I do? Use me, Lord. Help me have a contrite and humble spirit. 
Ah, to know him, to feel him. There was a two men. There was there was an auditorium full of people. Here's the analogy I want you to leave with today. There was an auditorium full of people, and they were holding a oratory contest, a public speaking contest. And they called up a man. He was before the last contestant. He was. He came up and he was looking really nice, had a nice suit on, an Italian silk tie, a crisp white shirt. He was manicured, pedicured, was educated. Shoes were shiny. He looked like he had just been pulled out of a GQ magazine. Looked good. He stood there and he recited Psalm 23. And he did it with great eloquence, with great pose. And when he was done, everybody broke out uh, clapping. But then the last contestant came up. And he was in his 80s, old shoes, a weathered jacket, tattered pants, had a cane, walked with a limp. His face was weathered. You could tell that he had been through a lot of dark valleys. And he walked up to the podium with a little bit of a limp. And he too recited Psalm 23. But when he was done, the crowd broke out in a standing ovation. People were crying, cheering. It was craziness. After the event, someone approached the young man in the nice suit and asked him, You both recited Psalm 23. You got the crowd to clap, but this man got a standing ovation with tears. What was the difference? The young man said, the difference is that I know the psalm of the shepherd, but he knows the shepherd of the psalm. Amen. And so my question to you today is, do you know the shepherd of the psalm? Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? And I want to give you this opportunity to know the shepherd of the psalm. Some of you have yet to know him. Some of you have heard of him. Some of you have quietly rejected him because you don't think it's time for you yet. Well, today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. And so what that means is we oftentimes hear people say, I make him Lord and Savior. No, we don't make him anything. He is Lord and Savior. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. We don't make him. We acknowledge his sovereignty in our lives. We acknowledge him as our personal Lord and Savior, but he's already king. He's already all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. That's who he is. But then we take that step and we say, I make you my personal Lord and Savior. And so my invitation to you is, you may be at a point where you have never taken that step and you're thinking about the shepherd and the sheep and you're thinking, that's exactly what I need. I need the shepherd because I'm lost, because I've gone astray, because I don't know what's going on in my life. I need to be restored. My soul needs restoration. I need him. I need him. I need him. If that's you. And you've never done that before. And you need to receive him for the very first time. Or you have at some point in your life, but you have fallen so far away from him, and you've gone back into your worldly ways because of the influence of this world is so strong, and you want to rededicate your life because you've come today to the realization that you need him more than ever before. If you are any one of those two, Everyone's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one looking around. Please raise your hand if that's you. I want to see who you are. And you say, today I want to rededicate my life. Today I want to say yes to him. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, sisters. Thank you so much. I see those hands going up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you put your hands down now, please? I'm going to pray this prayer. There's no formula to it. It's not a template that I follow. It's simply... A conversation with God. And I'm just going to ask you to repeat, but you have to repeat it from the depths of your heart. 
believe it with your mind and your heart that he is who he says he is and that you accept him into your heart as your Lord and Savior. So would you repeat everyone in, in, in the church today to support our brothers and sisters. Would you repeat with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and I repent of my sin. I recognize that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and that you rose on the third day. Father, forgive my sins. As of today, I make you my Lord and Savior. As of today, I will follow you the rest of my life. And I know that I will dwell in your house forever. Amen. Keep your, keep your, yes, amen. Keep your heads bowed, please, and your eyes closed. I want to pray for everyone before we leave today. Father, we come before you right now in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, that you're so good. That you loved us first, even before we knew about you, even before we chose you, Father, you chose us. Thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, that he died on the cross for our sins, that we would be saved and that we would have hope of eternal life. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that we are the sheep. You are the shepherd. You restore our soul. You provide for us. You are our shalom. You are Rapha. Lord, you are the Lord that is more than enough. You are everything that we will ever need. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, that we can wake up and in the midst of trials and tribulations and tests and the things that are going on in our world and perhaps even issues within the family, Father, that you continue to say, I am your shepherd you do not lack anything at all. I've got you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would take that Psalm 23, not as a quote, a vernacular quote, a popular quote, but they would take it as a lifestyle, that they would live it as a mindset, Father, as a way of life, that every day while they go through situations, that they would recall that you are the shepherd, that you lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Besides still waters that you make us lie down, Father. That you restore our soul. That even in the presence of our enemies you prepare a table. That our cup runneth over, Father. That you are so good. Father, I don't know what my brothers and sisters are going through today, Father. But I know that as they position themselves in faith. In your presence with a humble and contrite spirit. That your healing anointing. That sweet healing anointing is falling upon them, healing their minds, healing their hearts, healing their families. Use them, Father, as a vessel, as an instrument, Father, to reach other people. May they have humble and contrite spirits, and may they be open to hear from your spirit, Father. Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us, that you love us, and that you are our shepherd. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.